thing we co-create with God here and now is our lives with him in partnership with God. And so it's that idea of creating a life according to God's rhythm for living life, not according to what we are accustomed to and all the chaos and craziness that seems to capture us. And so we're talking about today rest, this idea, this idea of the Sabbath and rest as part of the rhythm that we need to learn better and better. We're going to be talking about relationships next week that we need to learn more and more about because so much of the rhythm of our life gets us out of touch with people and the need for meaningful, authentic relationships. We'll be talking about worship. We'll be talking about growth and learning. We're talking about play and pleasure. God created us for play and for pleasure. So, but today, we're going to talk about rest. And so let's pause and ask for God's spirit to fall upon us through his word. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be yours speaking to us, dwelling in us. And may they be pleasing to you, oh God, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're designed to rest. That's what we're talking about today. It's a part of the rhythm. And, and here's my question. This is the million-dollar question, and there are probably a lot of answers to this, but why is rest such a struggle for us? I think there's something ingrained in the American psyche, in kind of our culture that we've inherited, and, and there are different things we can say. I'm going to suggest two different reasons why working hard is so ingrained in our American psyche. And they, they both start with a G. I'm going to take them one at a time. The first one is greed. Uh, you know, Madison Avenue has its claws in us. Have you noticed that? H how many of you get phone calls from solicitors for different items that you could... How many of you, uh, you know, bite when Rooms to Go says you can have the next 100 years interest-free? Uh, you know, we... All these deals that feed our desire for more and more and more. And it's a bottomless pit, this idea of greed. Max Weber. Max Weber was a famous sociologist, and he put it this way. He said, man is dominated by the making of money, by acquisition as the ultimate purpose of his life. Now, don't get me wrong. Making money is not bad in and of itself, but... In, in, in the spirit of what he said, if it's the ultimate purpose of your life, then you are out of sync, out of step, out of rhythm with God. Your life is twisted and distorted. Another, another way in which working hard is sort of ingrained in our American psyche, if it's not greed, I think it might be guilt. We have inherited this thing, and you've heard it, called the Protestant work ethic. And what's attached to the Protestant work ethic is this very insidious thing. It's a double-edged sword. It's a good thing about, you know, we're hardworking and, and so on. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and so on. But the other side of that, the flip side of that coin is this. Your value and your worth is attached to how much you produce. In other words, the more you're like a machine, the more value you have. The more you can point to, that you can measure, that you can produce, the more worth you have. That is distorted. And we have fallen prey to that. And, and, and I'm no different. You know, I've, I've always been a, a minister ever since I graduated from college. And I started out in, uh, as a youth minister full time. And I graduated from college and I was working 50 to 60 hours a week right off the get-go. And it certainly, you know, in my case, it wasn't greed, obviously, because in, in my first year, full-time ministry got paid $12,500 for full-time work. So it wasn't greed, but, the, but there was another payoff. And I think this, this is something I struggle with and that we all do. We all get some payoff, don't we, when we are just overloading ourselves in something disproportionately. We get a payoff of some sort. And uh, for mine, it was the strokes. It was, it was being liked. It was the idea that I could you know, help people and get gratification from that. And the day that I read, in the earliest days of my ministry, this book by Tim Hansel, When I Relax, I Feel Guilty, I felt liberated. Especially when I read some really profound words, just one little sentence in this book, and I have it underlined, I have it highlighted, I have little stars and asterisks next to it, and this is the line, and it'll come up on your screen. What I am is more important than what I do. What I am is more important than what I do. Now, you don't have to be a minister for that to apply, right? 
That applies to every single one of us. We are not created to be machines, and the measure of our worth is not what we produce. It's who God makes us to be. And the rhythm of your life determines which extreme you're going to. What I am is more important than what I do. We jump through so many hoops, don't we? Hoops of affirmation, hoops of, of, of approval. And, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, that's my weakness. I like to be liked. You know, I want to please people. And I want, you know, the strokes. And, and, and you know, you don't have to be employed for that to be the case, right? It can be the case in a civic organization, a volunteer capacity. It can be the case in your family and, and so on. I like to think, as, I think partly as a pastor, but also as a man, this is the affliction of men, is I have this S on my chest. You know what I'm talking about? And I can handle your problem and my problem and our problem and a few of the world's problems, and I'll get it all done by about dinner time. Problem is, that is just a fantasy. That doesn't play out. And the truth is, for me as a pastor, I could work 24 hours, seven days a week, and never solve all those problems. You've been there? I mean, it gets, you know, it's, it's a fantasy that we have in our head. And, and so we work harder because we can make a difference and we can do better and we can so on and so forth. And so work becomes, it becomes addictive. It becomes a high because we think that we're just checking the box and moving forward. And so when I read these words from Tim Hansel in this awesome book, it really caught my attention. And tell me if it doesn't catch your attention. He said this, when work becomes a person's all-consuming interest, even if the work is good and necessary, it is idolatry. Yeah, that, that, that goes right between the eyes. Anything that takes the place of God's purpose for your life, even ministry, any kind of work, even family, the things that consume you, your all-consuming interest, good and necessary, it can become idolatrous. And boy, that got my attention. And, I, and so I think that, you know, it's not just me, it's the, it's the human condition. I think it's the American thing uniquely, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But I want to suggest to you that God has given us a way out. God has provided a way out of the self-destructive pattern by giving us the Sabbath, the Sabbath day of rest. But God didn't just give it to us and teach us about it. God modeled it in the very act of creation. Six days God created. Six days God worked. And here's how it's recorded in the second chapter of Genesis. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, God is showing a rhythm for life. It's a divine rhythm for all of us, not just God. Work and rest. Sabbath. Six days work, one day of Sabbath. Now, you might be asking the legitimate question, does God get tired? Does God need to rest? To which I would tell you, no, God doesn't get tired. God doesn't rest from fatigue. So why is this rest thing there in the first place if God didn't need it? Ah, oh, good question. God was continuing to work by creating rest. God created rest and worked by making it holy and blessing it. That's what God was doing for us, with us, so that the Sabbath day would be made holy. Holiness means to be set apart, unique from everything else. And so the Sabbath day, this day of rest in God, is to be different from every other day. As you know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And do you know that in the Hebrew language, there are no words for the days of the week? Every day of the week is referenced according to its distance from the Sabbath day. In other words, you have the first day toward the Sabbath, the second day toward the Sabbath, the third day toward the Sabbath. You don't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Everything revolves around the Sabbath. So central was it, is it, to God's identity, God's rhythm for our life, that day of rest. You see, by creating the Sabbath, God sanctified time. God sanctified, made holy time. Now, the thing that you need to check out here is the difference in the way the Bible talks about time and God's use of time and the way we talk about time. We use economic language for time, don't we? We say uh, we spend time, just like money. We'll even 
say time is money, right? Or that's going to cost me time. We use economic language. It's very crass, but God doesn't do that. God hallows time, makes it holy and unique for a certain purpose, and it's for us to live in that holiness of time. So God created time. Time didn't exist before God. That's a mind bender, isn't it? God created time, blessed it, and God made us to experience time in a certain way as the creator of time and of us. So remember, you're created, you're designed to co-create with God. So what are you co-creating? You didn't create time, but here's the deal. You're designed to create the use of your time. God created time itself, but you and I have a role with God to create the use of our time. And we all create it in different ways. If we have good things that are God-honoring, that matter, that have deep meaning, eternal value, have redemptive worth. And we can say one of two things. I don't have time for play, for pleasure, for leisure. Or I don't have time to read or to study. I don't have time to pray. Or I don't have time to laugh and love. I don't have time to visit with these friends or to connect with people in a deep way. I don't have time to worship. I don't have time to help. Or the other option is to say, I will make time. Because God has imbued you with the ability to make time with him, to make it have purpose. And here's the big biblical idea. And and this, if you like to take notes, this is the big idea around which everything is revolving here. The big biblical idea is this. We make time for things that matter because God created your time to matter. You don't just go through life by default. It's purposeful. God has a design. God has a rhythm. We listen for God's voice to live in that rhythm. But we have such a cacophony, so much chaos, so much clutter in our lives, so much busyness that we can't often hear God's voice, can we? The the story is really depicted by a, a man who was a Native American. He was visiting a friend in New York City, busy Manhattan. You've perhaps been there. You've seen it on TV. There's, there, are, there are cars, there's traffic, there's taxis, there's honking horns, people walking, talking. It's crazy. It's all echoing off the buildings. Wind is howling through the streets and corridors. And this Native American is walking with his friend who lives in New York City. And they're walking along in this concrete jungle. And the Native American says, I hear a cricket. The guy says, you don't hear a cricket. You can't, there's no way you could hear a cricket chirping in this. He says, let's, let's look at the noise. Let's, let's look at the people. It's every, he says, no, 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 no. I hear a cricket. Come here. Come here. He walks over, and there's a potted plant in a cement kind of pot. He lifts up a leaf, and he says, there it is. Chirp, chirp. He says, listen, people hear. They're trained to hear certain things and not hear other things. Let me illustrate He reaches into his pocket. He pulls out a handful of pocket change. He holds it up on the sidewalk and drops it. Every person within a block turns to look. They could hear that, but they couldn't hear the cricket. Our ears need to be retrained to hear the voice of God as God has his purpose for living life for us to enjoy. The Sabbath helps you to listen. The Sabbath helps renew you. It helps restore you. It helps you to make time matter. There is a reason why the Sabbath, the word Sabbath, that Hebrew word, is used 154 times in the Bible. Something that's used that much is God wants to get our attention. And the word rest, which is the same as Sabbath, is used in addition to that number of times. Now, you might be asking, well, what exactly does Sabbath mean? Good question. There are a couple of answers. One is it means intermission. We can all connect with that term. We're watching a football game and there's an intermission. The football team goes into the locker room and they don't come out again because they were tired, right? No, of course not. They go in to get re-energized, come back out and engage more fully. That's what Sabbath is about. It's not about retiring from life. It's not about burning out and then not being able to do anything and just relaxing with, you know, a corona on the beach. It's about re-engaging life. It's intermission. It's rest. It's to cease and to be completed, about being complete by God's design. And there's no accident that this idea of Sabbath is attached to another Hebrew word that you've heard before, shalom. Shalom, we all know, sort of, we use it like aloha, 
hello, goodbye, but even that word means more than hello, goodbye. Shalom means hello, goodbye, but it also means peace and wholeness and well-being and contentment. It's this idea of being made whole, of living as whole persons as God intended in God's rhythm. And so good, uh, good Jews on the Sabbath day, as they're walking past one another on the sidewalk, have a greeting, a traditional greeting. They will say Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, which is Hebrew for Sabbath peace to you, Sabbath wholeness to you, Sabbath contentment, Sabbath pleasure to you. It's no accident that the Jews talk about the Sabbath day not as a a day of piety and seriousness, but as a day of pleasure, a day of fun, a day of feasting, a day of sleeping. In fact, one rabbi said this, tell nothing on the Sabbath which will draw tears because it's to be a day of joy, a day of life, a day of sharing together with God and one another. Sabbath rest is a lifestyle of joy. And so, as I've I've struggled with this whole idea my whole whole adult life and and how to live in that rhythm, I I read these words, this challenge really to me and now to you from... Tim Hansel in his book, and it's a question. Is there anything about us that would force people to say, now that's living, that's the way I wish I could live? A joy-filled life will always demand an explanation, but too often we want life without having to change our lifestyle. And again, It just nailed me right between the eyes, and perhaps you as well. Sabbath renews you to live fully. Sabbath renews you to live and serve God joyfully. But we often, we burn the candle at both ends, as we call it, right? We'll we'll burn, we'll work hard, work hard with the idea of we're going to retire and relax in the Bahamas, right? And then we have nothing left to give, and we burn ourselves out, and that's not God's rhythm. By the time you retire, you ought to have more energy because you've been living this rhythm your entire life, being renewed along the way, not waiting to be renewed. That's the fallacy. And, you know, and, and I so often see it. People get there, they retire, and then they die of a heart attack two years later because they've totally killed themselves their whole life. That's not God's design for a living. You ought to have, by the time you retire, more energy. You certainly have more time and wisdom and creativity to offer than at any other time of your life because you're living in rhythm with God. Bonnie Bakanowski is a great witness of this. Bonnie doesn't worship at this service, but she worships at the 10 o'clock service. Bonnie is like 76 years old. She walks with a cane. Bonnie sings in the choir over there. Bonnie came to me this week to talk about starting a new women's Bible study during the daytime. And if you're interested in that, ladies, uh, I can talk to you about that. It's in the bulletin. But Bonnie also did something pretty amazing for who she is. Bonnie volunteers right now for you and our children over in the children's hour. And Bonnie, I was told a couple weeks ago, they were looking for Bonnie when the kids were doing that parachute game. They're all doing the parachute up and down. And Bonnie, bless her heart, was found sitting on her duff in the middle of the floor under the parachute, playing with the kids. Here's a little snippet of what God is doing in the life of Bonnie Mikowski. Hi, my name is Bonnie. Uh, I'm a member of the Stewart Congregational Church here, and uh, it's been a wonderful uh, experience for me. I feel that God, God led me here uh, through friends, a uh, very good neighbor, and I am uh, not only found it to be a warm and wonderful place, and that the people were, are are so wonderful. I enjoy the sermons so much. I think they're so meaningful. And I've found some wonderful opportunities that I think uh, a lot of you might also enjoy the, to share their experience uh, in volunteerism with the uh, church. I have uh, joined the choir and part of the uh, Bible studies groups. And uh, my latest passion is uh, serving in the, the nursery, in the uh, preschool. Uh, where they often need volunteers. We're lucky enough to be able to uh, take care of little babies, rock them and feed them and do what they need so their parents can go to the service and be able to uh, in, participate in the service while we care for their little ones. And it's a great ministry and uh, anyone who is interested 
should uh, speak to D. Carr, who was the children's ministry leader, and um, she'll be glad to talk with you. It's a it's it's a great opportunity, a wonderful blessing, and I think God is God's mission for us to do things like that. I know I feel that way, and I'm very happy. Praise God for Bonnie, right? Uh, Bonnie is serving God joyfully in these golden years of her life, and we are benefiting from that. Our children are benefiting right now. She was preaching to the earlier church because they're the ones that could follow her suit, that could follow. When, listen, the Sabbath renews you to engage life with a full tank. Bonnie, with all her limitations, obviously has a full tank. And when you feel like your tank is on half empty, that should be one of those warning signs that you're not living in rhythm with God's Sabbath rest, among other things. That's why J.R. Briggs said this about the Sabbath. He said, instead of rest from work, which is how we typically think of it, we enter into a new mindset where we work from our rest. That completely turns the tables, doesn't it? Sabbath is not about taking time off. It's about retaking time, remaking your time with God. And that's why the Jews have this famous saying. They say, you don't keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath keeps you. It shepherds you, it, sh- it, 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 sh- it molds you, it shapes you, my heart. That's why again and again throughout scripture, there's this admonition to rest in God. Psalm 62 verse five, for instance, says this. Yes, my soul find rest in God, my hope comes from him. From God alone, we rest, and it's there we find hope. We, tr- we put our hope in our efforts, in our work, in our producing, but that's not where we find ultimate hope. Jesus said, This famous text in Matthew chapter 11, he said, come to me all you that are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. We trade with Jesus. He promises to take our burdens and to give us his rest, his shalom, his wholeness, his contentment. In Exodus, we see this was happening for the Israelites and it says this in Exodus 31, then the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come. We are past this pattern down to the generations. So you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. You are not the Lord. You don't work as if you are God. Even God rested. Now here's what's cool about that text. God makes you holy not by what you do, but by what you don't do. We often have this idea that we have to jump through all these hoops religiously and and say and do certain things, but at the very beginning, God is saying, it's by what you don't do that you acknowledge me as Lord and I make you holy. It's an amazing gift. And that's exactly why, as a gift, God made this idea the third of the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, it reads like this, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male, your female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Do you think God wanted to cover the bases? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." again and again and again. Now, why was this so important? Why is this such a gift for them and for us? We have to remember the history. This is being given, first of all, to the the Hebrews who had been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. I mean, they're working seven days a week, nonstop, sun up to sun down. No break, no rest, no reflection, no wholeness, no contentment. They were simply cogs for the Egyptians, they were machines. And the very first thing God does is say, you're gonna have Sabbath rest. You're gonna be renewed, you're gonna be made whole, you're gonna be human. You're a human being, not a human doing. And so we're liberated to be holy through the Sabbath rest, to be whole again. God's Sabbath rhythm, it, opens new, it opens new possibilities for them. It opens new possibilities for you and me so that we can become who God created us to become. We can do what God created us to do that we couldn't do on our own. You see, the idea is this, what is not possible for us is possible with God. It's a little bit like, it's a little bit like the bumblebee. You, you've seen bumblebees, you know, they're around. 
You know, bumblebees can't fly. Uh, scientifically, that is. They can't fly. Their, their bodies are too large. They're not aerodynamic whatsoever. And proportionate to their bodies, their wings are way too small. They simply cannot fly scientifically. But guess what? Somebody forgot to tell the bumblebee. And, and it's that idea for you and me that we, when we are resting in Christ, we take flight to embrace life to the max. God's rest gives us new possibilities, new ears to hear, new eyes to see, a new heart filled with joy and with love and with peace despite the worst circumstances of life. God doesn't promise great circumstances, but God promises to carry us through it, to help us fly through it. There's this amazing letter that Tim Hansel shares with us in his book. It's from an unknown Confederate soldier. And you know what that existence was like for him. And he wrote these words. He said, I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked God for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I, was, I asked God for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I hoped for, almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men the most richly blessed, he wrote. You see, when you rest in God, you overflow with gratitude, regardless of the circumstances. You take flight and you live in a rich way, even in difficulty. Do you see now why the Sabbath idea was so important to the Jews? It was hugely important, but the problem was and is that most good things that are so important often get taken to an extreme and get distorted. And that's exactly what happened. Do you know that by Jesus' day, they had 1,521 things that you could not do on the Sabbath because it was determined that that was work. And you couldn't do that and honor the Sabbath. And it became legislated and legalistic, and it bound people. And as an example, a couple, few examples here. Do you know that you could not tie a knot on the Sabbath because it was work? And so it was a problem in a day when the only way you got water was through a well, and you had to lower a bucket down a well, and in order to lower a bucket, you had to tie a knot. If you didn't have that knot pre-tied, you were in trouble. So they had ways of getting around it, and this is the way legalism works, ways of getting around it. A woman's girdle somehow uh, could be fastened in such a way that it was not tying a knot. So they would use a woman's girdle to lower a bucket to get water. How silly is that? It gets worse, actually. Another way, if you had a toothache back then, what you did was you gargled with vinegar. That's all they had. But gargling with vinegar was work. So they allowed you to dip your toothbrush in vinegar. I mean, talk about splitting hairs, but it gets even worse than that. If you like radishes, it was okay if you dipped your radish in salt, but for heaven's sake, do not leave your radish in salt because it might pickle. And somehow that was construed as work and against the law, the Sabbath law. Do you see the extremes to which it went? It was absolutely absurd. And that legalistic spirit has remained with us all the way to this day. In the 17th century, there was a man in Scotland who was actually arrested and put in jail on the Sabbath day because he was smiling and smiling was against the law. We inherited in America, the Puritans. This is a Puritan guy right here. He looks really full of life and joyful, doesn't he? The Puritans, the Puritans created what, was, what came to be known as the iron cage of life. The iron cage in which we live where the spontaneous enjoyment of life on the Sabbath was to be expunged as quickly as possible. And if you were caught having fun on the Sabbath, this next slide shows you what might happen to you. There you go. That's what happens when you have joy in the Puritan mindset. That is not God's design. Jesus came to redeem not just our souls for heaven, to redeem everything, including the Sabbath for you and me. That's why when he was walking through the cornfield on the Sabbath day, he's walking with his disciples, and they're hungry, and there's corn to eat. 
It's against the law to pick corn, against the law to harvest in any way on the Sabbath. But he's, he knows. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. They're hungry. God they made the Sabbath for pleasure. So he picks it and they eat. And then the religious people, how dare you? You're breaking the law. And you know what Jesus said? In Mark chapter 2, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You've turned this around. You've twisted this around. This is not God's rhythm for your life. You see, there's an irony at work here. You see the extremes to which people went to keep, to observe the Sabbath religiously? I think the irony for us sitting here today as Americans is this. We go often to extremes to avoid the Sabbath. We're often overworked and overwhelmed and burnt out and we don't know any better. We think that's the norm. Let me give you some, some statistics just to kind of illustrate this. In 1960, only 20% of mothers worked. And this is not a commentary against women working. I, believe, I think it's fine. But it's, a, it's a, an illustration of the cultural shift. Today, 70% of American kids live in a home where both parents work. There's a huge shift that's happened in the work culture of America, and we've inherited that, and we're passing that on. Psychologists talk about role overload where there is this new phenomenon in the last 20 or 30 years of having to balance the roles in the workplace and in the home. And there's a lot of work in both arenas. Over 134 countries have laws setting maximum hours for a work week. The United States does not. In the United States, 86% of men, 66% of women work more than 40 hours a week. The lion's share of people work more than 40 hours a week. Americans, listen to this, this is interesting. In a year, in a year, Americans work 137 more hours per year than the Japanese. Now, we often think the Japanese are, I mean, these are techno wizards. They produce, they produce. We work more than they do, 260 more than the British, 500 more hours than the French. Now, that may not surprise you. <laughs> but let me tell you what, that's a commentary on something else that sociologists term, and this is really an interesting thing. We are victims of what's called time poverty. Time poverty. We don't have time. We have so little leisure time, so much, so little discretionary time. The American leisure time declined by one third since 1970. That is substantial in our culture. This is what we're living out and we're passing on. Now, you might think, well, that means we're more productive and we're leaders and we're, we're benefiting from that. But, oh, contraire, because the statistics say the opposite. Productivity for the American worker has increased 400% since 1950, which means our standard of living should be four times greater than 1950, but it's not. It's not. Some are benefiting, but the vast majority are just working harder. And... Psychologists tell us one of the byproducts of all this is what's called sleep deficit. You probably know what that's about, don't you? They tell us that we get 60 to 90 minutes less sleep per night than is optimum for our health. Do you see what's being created? What's being created, what we've inherited, what we perpetuate unknowingly is an anti-Sabbath lifestyle, an anti-Sabbath culture unique to America compared to all other countries. This is God's wake-up call for us. We don't have contentment. Working harder and longer doesn't bring peace. We are empty. We're fractured. It's a lot like the story of the man whose son came, came in. He, the, he, the dad came home from work. It was late. And he wanted to spend some time with his dad, but his dad was just exhausted from working so hard. It was late in the evening, and so he had an idea. He had the newspaper in his lap, and there was a picture of the earth that was taken from the moon in the newspaper. He cut it out around it, and he gave it to his son. But before he did so, he cut the picture of the earth in little tiny pieces, making a jigsaw puzzle out of it. Almost impossible to tell what was what with all the pieces mixed up. It would take him a long time to tape it back together. He thought, well, I can, get some, I can relax while my son's doing that. Lo and behold, to his great surprise, it only took 10 minutes his son comes back with the earth perfectly taped together. He's like, oh, how did you do that? He said, easy, Dad. On the back side of that piece of paper was a picture of a man. I just put the man together, and the earth was made whole. It came together. 
That's God's design for you and me, guys. When I put the man together, the earth, it comes together. God has a design, a rhythm for you and me. Create rest in your life with God. Create rest. God's rhythm makes you whole and makes it all come together. Thanks be to him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are amazing in your provision for how we live this life. Not only for redeeming us for life hereafter, but for life here and now. And we thank you for the amazing wisdom for how to be completed, how to be whole, for contentment and peace, for shalom. We pray that shalom would flood our hearts this day. That we might live life in step with you. That you might come alive evermore in us. And that the earth, the world, would be made whole as a result. We thank you for that grand vision, much grander than we have, of the time that we spend. Thank you for sanctifying time and for making us holy through the use of time, through your love, through your grace, through your power, through your majesty. And it is in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen.